I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hi, I'm Luke Ryan for JoeBlow.com and welcome to Movie Endings Explained, where we'll be taking a look at some of the more ambiguous and discussed movie endings that have left audiences debating their true meaning long after the credits have rolled. Previously on Movie Endings Explained, we've tackled a number of Christopher Nolan's films, as traditionally they tend to feature perplexing or thought-provoking endings, from The Dark Knight Rises to Inception, and even Interstellar. There are plenty of ideas and theories to talk about, and we have done in this series. Yet there's still more to mine from Christopher Nolan's filmography if we cast our minds back to 2006, at which point the celebrated master director didn't have quite the reputation he has now. He was renowned, of course, and his previous film Batman Begins had gone down very well, but when he released The Prestige, it was with significantly less pomp and circumstance, though the film itself is all about that kind of showmanship. The Prestige is set in 1890s London and follows two stage magicians, Robert Angier, played by Hugh Jackman, and Alfred Borden, played by Christian Bale. In an unfortunate accident that Angier blames Borden for, his wife Julia drowns during a magic trick gone wrong inside a water tank. Angier and Borden splinter apart and form an intense rivalry. Borden finds success with a trick he calls the Transported Man, where he enters a cabinet and re-emerges from another on the other side of the stage in a matter of seconds. We see Angier, in disguise, attend one of Borden's shows to see the trick in the flesh. He proclaims it the greatest trick he has ever seen, but can't quite figure out how Borden pulled it off. Angier's assistant cutter, played by Michael Caine, insists the key to the trick is using a double, but Angier dismisses this as too simple. Dreadful magician. No, he's a wonderful magician. He's a dreadful showman. He doesn't know how to dress it up, how to sell it. Why, well, how does he do it? He uses a double. No, 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 no. It's too simple. This is a complex illusion. You only say that because you don't know the method. It's a double that comes out at the end. It's the only way. I've seen him perform the trick three times now, Mr. Carter. The prestige is the same man. No, it's not. The same man comes out of that second cabinet, I promise you. It's the same man. He wears padded gloves to hide his damaged fingers, but if you look closely, you can tell. A key detail to this sequence of the film is that we don't see the reveal of Borden re-emerging from the other cabinet, only the reactions of both Angier and Cutter watching from the audience. While Angier is amazed and envious, Cutter remains fairly unimpressed. As Olivia, Angier's assistant, pointed out, the Borden that reappeared on the other side of the stage also showed signs of missing two fingers, so it couldn't possibly be a lookalike, as Borden has two missing fingers. Still, Angier finds his own double, Gerald Root, who looks remarkably like Angier, but is an alcoholic and difficult to work with. Nevertheless, he goes ahead with his new transported man show, but finds that he has to be the one to set up the act with his showmanship skills and spend the payoff of the trick off stage while Gerald Root soaks up all the attention. Still not satisfied, Angier travels to meet with Nikola Tesla, played by David Bowie, believing that Tesla had created a machine for Borden to create a double artificially. And so, eventually, Angier debuts the real Transported Man act and clones himself on stage every single night. Borden can't understand how the trick is done and goes backstage one night to find out.
Angier supposedly drowns in the water tank while his new clone ends up on the balcony and Borden is framed for Angier's murder. The whole movie is framed around this murder with Borden being in prison and on trial and the majority of the story being told in flashback. At the very end of the film, Angier comes to meet Borden in prison under the alias of Lord Coldlow. Borden, who is set to be hung for his murder, is disgusted by what Angier has done, as is Cutter, who had mourned over Angier's death. Borden then says goodbye to his assistant Fallon and is hung to death. Coldlow, or Angier perhaps, is set to destroy the cloning machine when he gets shot by Fallon. Or is it Borden? Cut and you, but I told him it was too simple, it was too easy. No. Simple maybe, but not easy. There's nothing easy about two men sharing one life. I don't understand how it can be bluesy again. So, hidden in plain sight was Borden's key to the transported man trick his twin brother. They both took turns playing Fallon and committed themselves to a life of secrecy, but also sacrifice. Angier dies and we end the film over a voiceover from Cutter that we heard at the beginning of the film. Now you're looking for the secret. But you won't find it because, of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to work it out. You want to be fooled. Thus, we end the film on a shot of Angier's many dead clones, suspended in water tanks, dumped in an empty theatre, which is about as symbolic as it gets. But Cutter's voiceover suggests there's more to the story, right? We knew that Angier was cloning himself every night, and in some twisted, sick penance for the guilt he feels over the death of his wife, was drowning himself every night too. It begs the question, why didn't Angier just clone himself once, and have his very own double to pull off the same trick that Borden had? Why the endless cycle of killing and copying himself? The difference between the two is that Borden was able to make the sacrifice of living both a double life and a half life. Angier could never do that. When he first clones himself, he has a pistol ready to kill his double. He looks frightened, not capable to even try and talk to his clone. And yet, while he could seemingly never make the sacrifice of living a dual life with one double, he was able to make the sacrifice of killing himself every night. However, the entrapment of Borden to the murder of Angier is clearly by design, and so perhaps the sole purpose for killing himself every single night was to wait for the right moments when Borden would sneak backstage and to finally exact his ultimate revenge on the man he blames for his wife's death. But back to the final voiceover, did we miss anything? Anything that wasn't already laid out by Borden in the final scene between the two rivals? Ultimately, I don't think so, and the conclusion of the film is actually fairly clear-cut. Yet it does invite you to think that you've missed something, 
that there is something more, another layer to the mystery that will never be discovered, because it isn't there. The words Cutter say are summing up the whole story, almost breaking the fourth wall and speaking to us, the audience, about it. For more context, listen to his opening narration closely. Every magic trick consists of three parts, or acts. The first part is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary, a deck of cards, a bird, or a man. He shows you this object. Perhaps he asks you to inspect it, to see that it is indeed real. Yeah, an old No. But of course, it probably isn't. Oh, where did you think you were going? Oh, the bloody axe, you uh. fool! The second act is called the turn. Magician takes the ordinary something and makes it do something extraordinary. Now, you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it. Because, of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. You want to be fooled. But you wouldn't clap yet, because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. That's why every magic trick has a third act. The hardest part. The part we call the prestige. So, the way I interpret the film, and its ending, and its message, is that the whole movie is the prestige. The three acts of a magic trick, the three acts of a movie. The cloning plot is fantastical smoke and mirrors. While it's vital to the story, of course, the real trick is how Borden pulled off the transported man. When you first view the movie, you likely get so wrapped up in it that your mind wanders from that point, and you become more engaged in the flashy idea of Angier actually cloning himself. And the real skill to the trick, that Borden was Fallon and Fallon was Borden, was really hinted at all along. The entire movie is foreshadowing and payoff. In the scene where Angier is going through Borden's diary, it reads, We were two young men at the start of a great career. Two young men devoted to an illusion. Two young men who never intended to hurt anyone. Angier's perspective on this imagines that to be himself and Borden, but really, it means Borden and his brother, Fallon. Early on, Borden is on stage during a disappearing and reappearing bird trick. A young boy in the audience is upset by the trick and Borden tries to comfort him. When the boy asks where the bird's brother is, meaning the double, watch Borden's telling reaction. The boy seeing through the trick hits a little bit too close to home. In another scene, Angier and Borden go to see Chung Ling So, a magician who can make a full fish tank disappear on stage. Afterwards, they spot him leaving the building, and Borden admires his commitment to the illusion, his total devotion to the art. He's pretending to be a cripple. Borden respects it for a reason, while Angier scoffs. He can't fathom the idea of committing to being someone else 24-7, and even tells his wife, it's unthinkable which is why he never suspects that that is how Borden pulled off his transported man trick, and his utter disbelief that it could be as simple as using a double tricks us into believing that too. Borden's wife Sarah even says that when he tells her he loves her, she can tell sometimes he doesn't mean it, because sometimes he's not himself. His relationship with his wife is peppered with clues and little details throughout the entire film. The reveal at the end that Borden, or even Fallon, went through with hacking off his own two fingers also to maintain the double illusion is hinted at when Sarah is redressing his hand and says, I don't understand. How can it be bleeding again? 
let's go back to the very first line of the movie spoken by Borden. Are you watching closely? The entire movie foreshadows its reveal, but what would be the fun in it if you figured it out so soon? As Cutter says, you're not really looking for it, because you want to be fooled. And I think most of us do. There are quite a few wild theories out there about the prestige that all feel a bit too far-fetched for my personal tastes, but are nevertheless going to be explored by those who find the yearning for something even more from the film. One is that the Tesla cloning machine was never real, and the movie is simply tricking us into believing something so fantastical could be real. That just seems like quite a hollow and unsatisfying idea to me personally, as are most of the theories revolving around the film. The 1995 book written by British writer Christopher Priest plays a little more differently than its movie adaptation towards the end. I won't break it down fully, but Borden turns off the cloning device halfway through one of Angie's performances, and his clone becomes incomplete, a ghostly duplicate and weak. He becomes terminally ill and his duplicate seeks revenge by killing Borden. The original Angier passes away and his duplicate tries to transport himself into the original Angier's body. It's then hinted at in an ambiguous way that some form of Angier continued to exist into present day. I don't know about you, but I think I prefer the movie version. But what did you think of the Prestige's ending and reveal? Do you think there's more to the picture? Something everyone else has missed? Let us know in the comment section down below. Stay tuned to the Joe Blow Videos channel for more original videos like this. And as always, thanks for watching.